Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and it's time for another, hey, ask me anything. This is the once a month live Facebook that we do where anybody can just ask, well, ask me anything. You can type your um, questions into the comments. Ellen, who, who is really the genius behind all this, will put those up and we'll um, go ahead and answer those. Um, today, though, isn't just a ask me anything. This is kind of, we're going to play, and I kind of promoted this in the little, in the little video we sh I shot earlier. Um, for the holidays, let's play a new holiday game, and let's call it Stump Gary. Th this is um, a game I like to play with, um, you know, speaking to garden clubs and the, and the like, to see who can come up with that question that I don't know. And I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, I don't know everything. Yeah, I, I'll admit it. I'll give it a good try. If I don't know the answer, I'll find the answer for you. But here's the thing. If you can stump me with a question, I'm going to send you, oh, I don't know. What would be a good, a good prize? Maybe like a seed collection from, from, my, from my garden and from my collection. I think that would be great for the holidays. And we won't limit this to just like one stumper out there. The first three people that can stump me with a question will get will get that um, will get that prize. I'll get that out this week. And Ellen, I'm going to ask you if you can help me keep track of what's all going on with this crazy game that we're going to play here today. And um, we'll, we'll be we'll be good with that. Um, obviously, I'm here at the Urban Nano Farm. And I'm on my back porch um, patio studio. And just, you know, I am surrounded by gorgeous poinsettias. You know, and poinsettias are, you know, you know if, are they that qu quintessential holiday plant, Christmas season plant? You know, and, and who doesn't love a brightly colored poinsettia? Now, I have to tell you, I'm kind of tied technology isn't working again so i'm i'm hardwired into the camera but when we look at you know a poinsettia like this that that's just that's just gorgeous um red just a little bit of trivia red is folks number one color red accounts for about 75 percent of poinsettia sales in the united states every year and, and it's just gorgeous. But people are always amazed. And hey, Robin, how you doing this morning? People are amazed that there are other colors than red. And there's other forms. Like this, I'm showing you a red poinsettia here. But, but look at this. It's variegated leaves. This is called tapestry. And I, if it's variegated, you know I'm going to have it. I really like this poinsettia. But when we look at other colors, I'm going to come over, bring another. How can you argue that pink is not a great color for poinsettias? There are white colors. Um, there, are, there are yellows. This one is called Golden Glow. Now, this is probably not a great color. You know, it, and in our surveys, people don't think that this is a traditional Christmas color, but what would you think about a poinsettia that's yellow like this instead of a fall mom? Nice autumnal color. Isn't that gorgeous? You know, and we can look at a different kind of pink. This is princettia. This is a hybrid poinsettia that has smaller flowers. And I'm going to say the pink that you see are not the flowers. These are called, these are modified leaves called bracts. The flowers are, and I'm going to come right in on the camera. Let's see here. Here, let's go right here. I got to figure this. I'm working backwards. Those little pea-like structures in the center of those colorful black bracts, those are the actual flowers of a poinsettia. And th there's, a, there's other colors. There's um, different um selections up all, all around all around my um the studio here but get out 
get buy some poinsettias this year and don't just look for red look for some of the other colors and see what see what you think about that the independent garden centers that we all um do our business with will have the best selection so go out go out and, and do that now let's see here we have got oh my gosh look at all the questions that we've got here this morning oh and here now, now this this is great here's an old classmate of mine, and sorry, Marion, yeah, you're, you're old just like me. But Marion Bledsoe, he was at Clemson with me way back in the day. And he wants to know the question, where did poinsettia get its name? Well, it started with an um, ambassador to Mexico named Poinsett. And he brought, he brought these plants back and thought that these were cool. They color up naturally in the natural day length. There were red at the holidays, and he had this idea that we could bring these back and use those. So Poinsett was a South Carolinian native, and I'm assuming that's where you were going with that, Marion. Listen, thanks. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, Dean Palm, I love the cinnamon and marble the best. And I'm just trying to think here. Um, I, don't, I don't have a cinnamon, but wait, wait a second. I have to unhook here. And th this is this is what Dean is talking about from a marbled kind of these bicolor two tone um, bracts on these. Generally, they're solid colors on the on the on the margins of the leaf, lighter colors on the on the middle. Though so, some of the selections are backwards of that, but this is kind of what we're talking about. And I like the marble versions too. And Chris Dews, good morning. It's good to see you. Okay, so here we have a, a serious question here now from Sharon. My buckeye tree for the first time ever did not produce buckeyes this year. Was it because of the bad weather we had in central Mississippi? And to tell you the truth, probably yes. You know, the buckeyes tend to bloom earlier in the spring. And if you were talking, you know, and, and I don't know which buckeye that you're talking about, but if it's a one of the red buckeyes, those are some of the earliest blooming in, in the springtime. And yeah, and if you, we had cold weather during that bloom, then yeah, you're not, you're not going to get any Buckeyes that year. So I'm going to blame it on Mother Nature. I, th I think she can handle that. And Becky loves the poinsettias. And Becky, let me, let me tell you, these poinsettias that we have here today at the Nano Farm, these are all examples of the poinsettias that we were showing and um, or showing or should I say showing off last Thursday at the South Mississippi Branch Station in Poplarville where we had our first annual poinsettia field day. Um, the field day we had 38 different poinsettias all different colors all different shapes all different sizes. We had over a hundred people show up we had consumers we had producers there, and it, and it was just a fun day that guarantee we'll be, we will be doing that in the future. In fact, we had a meeting of our Coastal Horticulture Research Group yesterday, and I think by the time we got done, we had 55 different poinsettias identified that we were going to try to get so we could um, display those. And also, I will say, about half of our plants went to Bellingrath Gardens this year. So if you missed the field day at Poplarville, head over to Bellingrath and Todd and his great crew over there, they have a bunch of our poinsettias along with theirs. So you can kind of see a, the, just the beauty and, and the, the width of the selections and colors of poinsettia there. It's, it'd be a, be a great, great place to visit. And Chris Dews, I like the traditional red. Go for it, man. Let's see. What else do we have here? How do I get rid of mother's tears and little clover like weeds in my earth boxes? They take over and all I do is pull up. 
Okay, Robin, I thought that we were going to have the first stumper question of the morning, but if, if you've got a weedy problem in your earth boxes, the first thing I'm going to ask, are you using the covers? Because if you're not using the plastic cover, you're, you're, you're looking at that whole surface of the top of the earth box, and yes, it will be a weed heaven. And, and for those that are, aren't, aren't familiar with earth boxes, earth boxes are basically, let's t think about them as window boxes that are 29 inches wide, but about 12 inches tall and about 13 inches deep. They're a sub-irrigated container. And part of the beauty of the system, and, and I will tell you, um, I have 136 earth boxes at my house. The beauty of the system is they're designed to work with a plastic cover over the top with holes cut in for your plants. And the plastic cover uh, blocks the um, evaporation from the system. And if you're not using the cover, you have that whole area that can get weeds in them. So I, I'm assuming, oh, okay, so Robin gets back. Yeah, I'm using the cover on most of them. Really? Yeah, and, and they do grow in the holes. Yeah, and I and I see weeds that, that grow in the holes where the plants are, and that's not a big deal. You just pop those out before, before they get big. But if you're not using the covers on all of them, I'll bet the biggest problems are the ones that you don't have covers on. So, okay, let's see here. Where are we at? I, I have totally lost my place here in the comments. Oh, gosh. I, I think we may have the first stumper here. Judy Wood, what small, red, and whispers. I don't know. You're going to, Judy, you are going to have to share the answer to that. And I'm just going to say you're the first winner of the, of the seed collection. So let's... Let's go ahead. I'm going to go down. I'm going to go down here to. Oh. And if anybody else can answer that question, that'd be, I'd appreciate that. Then we have a comment from Katie Bachman, my, my dear wife. She is up in Detroit in the frozen North. Dear, I am really sorry that you're up here, up there. It's right now here at the urban nano farm is 75 degrees. I have already changed clothes once. This could be a three change day. Not bad for December 10th. Okay, so you know we're going to wait for Judy to um, tell us what's small, red, and whispers. Judy Wood, a horse radish. I knew this was going to be a bad idea asking this. Okay, Judy, you are the first winner. Um, send your address to me. At, to Southern Gardening at msstate.edu, and I'll I'll get the I'll get the seed I'll get the seeds out to you. Okay, that was actually a good one. A horse radish. Okay, so Dean, how far back do you prune back passion vine and jasmine vine for the winter? I'm in South Carolina, just north of Savannah. Um, to tell you the truth, I would only prune those back just to keep them tidy. I don't think that's a, those are plants that you want to prune back hard, but we, we you know, you, you want those to be sprawling and crawling. And just if they're getting out of hand, prune those back and, ju and just get them back in bounds. And I think you'll be okay. Then Becky here, I have a thornless key lime. It's two years old. It's loaded. It was loaded with blooms this summer. And all the baby limes fell off, and a few that are left are on one branch. What could cause this? You know, Becky, that's actually a problem that we can have with a lot of our citrus. I know that I have, I have noticed we, I can get some of my citrus to – and wait, wait a second. Before we, start, before we start talking about that, let me brag on some citrus. Um, I was out – picking Meyer lemon today. You know, this is, this is December 10th. This is fantastic. I always love this time of year. 
you know, tangerines, satsuma oranges. Um, and all of these, I've noticed as I've been growing citrus over the last 14 years, we will go through periods where the trees will bloom like crazy, but then we basically don't, don't get any fruit or the fruit aborts. And a, a lot of that's environmental. It's, it's either excess rainfall or not enough water. Um, it could be nutrition. But generally, when we, we have a lot of blooms and we have a lot of fruit set, there, there's, a, there's a lot of times the, the, uh, those developing fruit put too much of a stressor on the resources in that plant, and that plant will abort those fruit. Um, that, that can happen a lot. Um, I've noticed on uh, Meyer lemons in the past, I can have, looks like there's like a bazillion flowers on there and there's no way that that tree can support all that and will lose a lot of the fruit. It also could be some poor pollination too, that when those trees are blooming, if there's not any pollinators out there, and I'm not talking about honeybees, but if there's not some of our native bees out there, not pollinating those flowers, we can get those fruit to start to develop and then, and then they fall off. You know, I'm just going to tell you, I don't have a good answer for it, but that's just some of the observations that, that I've had this year. About half of my fruit tree or my citrus trees this year have fruit. And I, I don't know, I have 15 or 18 out on the side yard. Half of them have fruit, half of them don't have fruit. They're all getting the same environment. So it's, I, I've, I found that citrus can be a little fickle. So that, that's all we can do. Just, just be patient and, and let's see what happens in the future. Now, Paula Miller, how do I get my Christmas cactus to bloom? I've, I have tried many ways. A lot of times the, um, the um, Christmas cactus, if it's been outside, those, those holiday cactuses need some cool weather and then they, then they need to come, then they need to come inside. So I'm just, I'm just going to tell you it's, it's environmental, whether too wet, too cool, too hot. Um, and that, that's really the, the cause they, they like, they like stable environment. So again, this is a be patient and, you know, try again next year or, support the industry, and buy a nice blooming one next year for the holidays. Okay, so now Dean Palm. Love the earth boxes. Have you tried any of the knockoff imitations? Yes, I, yes, I have. I, I've trialed, I've been contacted by companies to, to try some of the commercial versions and there's really not any magic to an earth box. Um, the earth box is based on sub-irrigation. And it's that idea of having a, a reservoir, a water reservoir in the bottom of the pot, and the water wicks up into the potting mix. Um, you, know, you know, you can, you can make sub-irrigated containers they they all they all work they all work by by the same by the same mechanism, and you know you, you can you can be fine with that. The imitations are fine. One of the things I found with the uh, with the imitations to the earth box is many of the imitations um, violate the patents that earth box has on their design. They, they, earth box doesn't patent sub irrigation but they patent the design of their box. And yeah, and I have, I don't know, at least two different knockoffs in the garden and they, and they work fine. You know, I, so, so I don't have any problem with that. I'm just a, I'm a dyed in the wool earth box fan. I've been using earth boxes for 14 years now. Um, I, I think, I think they're, they're the best system out there. Um, I like the design. They use food grade plastics that are all UV protected. And I, I would challenge anybody to come into my yard and find my earth boxes that have been out in the sun for 14 years. Find my original five. You can't do it. B 
because they look just like they did the day I, I un unpacked the box. So yeah, I, I don't have, don't have any problem with, with the knockoffs. And in fact, Dean, there's lots of plans out on the internet to build your own out of like Rubbermaid tubs. But remember, those aren't UV protected and they're cost wise. They're probably about a third to a half of the cost of an earth box, but they're not going to last, you know, two or three years because the sun's going to break them down. But yeah, if you, if you find some, some great, um, some great um, knockoff, you know, earth box, earth, earth box like containers, go ahead and use them. There won't be any problem with that. Okay. So Judy, yeah. A horseradish, yeah, we've got we've got that. Now Patricia's asking how to root azaleas. There, there's a couple of ways that, that you could do that. Um, probably the easiest for the homeowner is if you've got a an azalea that you want to root, is to take a lower branch and bend it down to the ground and like put a rock on it. And the, the ground contact with those stems will produce roots. You know, it might take a year, but could produce roots. And then you could go ahead and um, take that cutting off. But, but let, me, let me tell you, we, we, have, we have a lot of you know, you know, folks that want to try to root some of these woody flowering shrubs. And yes, it's fun to do from like a hobby perspective. But if you really want a plant that's going to be like the that azalea that you that you want, it's going to take three four years if you get if you get a branch to root to get to that size of the plant that you want. You're really better off going to the nursery and buying that plant. Let the growers do all that hard work, and then you get to take that plant home and enjoy it instead of worrying about that little cutting for three years. It's, I, I think, I think it's easier and I think you're better off in the long run do, doing it that way. But if you want, if you want to go ahead and try it, go ahead and try it. But what, when you're trying to root that azalea, don't just bend one branch down, bend five branches down, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 branches down and try and get those to root. Because chances are you're, that if you do one branch, it's either going to root or it's not. If you have more than one, you have a better chance of getting one to root. So go, go, go ahead go ahead and give, give that a try. Now we get down here to Dean. I like the five-gallon systems you tried, just right for herbs and peppers. And Dean is talking about a system that I found last year called Grow Bucket. And it's a, it's Grow Bucket are the components that go into a five gallon bucket and turn it into a sub irrigated container. I love those. I think I have 10 of those here. And we were growing tomatoes in those last year. And I'm switching over and I've, I've planted turmeric in them. And I want to see how it goes. But, but I think they're a great choice for herbs um, and, and the like. I'm going to try some flowers in them too this year. But Grow Bucket, found that on Amazon. Great, great choice for a sub-irrigated container. Okay, so, so now Robin here is, we're back, we're back to earth boxes again. The problem with the uncovered earth box is that where my dividing onions are, should I just dig up and get rid of the weeds and replant? Um, good, good, good question. Um, I grow onions in, in my earth boxes and I, I use the covers and I, gr I grow anywhere from 10 to 20 onions in a, in an earth box with, with the cover on. Um, I tell you, I just don't want to deal with all the weeds that you're going to get. And I, and I'd hate to dump out an earth box and wait and wait and waste, waste all that media. Um, so yeah, you, you, you know, you could keep going uncovered, you know, and if that's easier for, for those, for those onions, but um, I don't know. I, I, st I still like having the covers on there, Robin. I mean, I, I can't, I can't get away from that. Okay. Let's, let's see here. 
So Vivian asked the question, I have some large overgrown rosemary bushes that need to be pruned back a lot. When can I prune them? I'm in Talladega, um, Alabama. Um, good, good, que good question. If they're so overgrown, I would be tempted to wait until later on into late winter and prune them back to the size you want and, and let them regrow. I, I don't know if I would, if I would, if I would prune back now, we still have way too much warm weather here in the deep South to, to, to I think chance pruning something back hard and then taking the chance that they're going to start regrowing. And then we get blasted with some cold weather. So I, Tell you the truth, I would be patient. I would, I would wait. Um, no more questions. So what, what I want to, what I want to do now is I want to promote a couple of books that have been written from the um, folks at Coastal Research and Extension Center in Biloxi, where, where my home base is. The first book I want to promote is my Southern Gardening book. It's called Southern Gardening All Year Long. And it's available right now for pre-order on Amazon. Ellen is going to um, share the, um, the um, cover of the book after this in the comments. I will, I will share after we get done all the pre-order information from the publisher. The publisher is University Press of Mississippi. Really appreciate those folks. Um, the book is, is, was a fun project to do. It's all about being successful in the garden, trying things. It's not an encyclopedic plant this, plant this, plant this, plant this. It's not a big list of plants. It's more stories in the, in the way I write my Southern Gardening columns. Straightforward. And I, I look at it, it's, it's a conversation over the back fence with your neighbor as far as gardening goes. I, I've, I've, I've liked it. I've, I've seen the, um, the preprints. It is beautiful. It's 208 pages. There are 171 images, all that I took, believe it or not. And they are, they are just gorgeous. So we'll, sh we'll share that information and, um, and, you know, hopefully everybody will get out there and Hey, great Christmas present. Just a little bit of a hint. Um, it's going to be shipping in early March. So kind of get kind of get ahead of the curve. The other book I want to promote is from my colleagues again at Coastal Research and Extension Center, doctors Jim Del Prince, Christine Coker, Tricia Knight, and Christian Stevenson. But it's the promise of good things. And it's a holiday decorating book using plant material that are growing all around us. It, it is fabulous. Again, it, and it is a pretty book. Gives a lot of great decorating ideas of what we could use, you know, using plants from our landscapes and from, like I say, from what's growing all around us. That's also available on Amazon right now. I saw copies of that last week. Yeah, and it, it is it is pretty. So go go ahead and check and check that out. Great Christmas present. Okay, so what else? What else do we have here? Okay, so Dean asks again, do you change your soil mix every year in the earth boxes or, or just re-nourish it? What, you, what we do with the earth boxes, because we're using professional growing mix in there, we don't dump that out. In the 14 years that I've had earth boxes, and I have 136, remember, I have never dumped out an earth box. All we're doing is every time we plant and if we reach crop season, Go ahead, because it is it is orga organic material. It does break down, so we are, we're always adding mix to it, and then just fluffing it up, adding dolomite, adding the fertilizer, replanting, and just keep on rocking and rolling with those. Yeah, you never need to dump out an earth box. And one of the things that I, that I like to tell folks about the earth boxes and using the um, the, the uh, good professional growing mix. Some of my earth boxes have been growing tomatoes for 14 years, two crops a year in the same earth box. And we know that, you know, conventional 
uh, recommendations are we, we crop rotate. We don't plant tomatoes in the same place year after year after year because we get those bacterial wilt uh, buildups, so the inoculum builds up. Well, the earth box is different because of the growing mix. It's inhospitable to those root pathogens. And so I have never had an issue with wilt bacteria in 14 years, two crops a year. So some of my earth boxes have grown tomatoes, 28 crops in a row with no inoculum buildup. So that, that's, one, that's one of the reasons I like earth boxes and the fact that you don't have to dump them out and refill them every year. With 136, there are two cubic feet per earth box. So what is that? 136, 270 cubic feet. I couldn't grow in earth boxes if I had to uh, redo that every year. So that, that's, Dean, that, that, that's, that's what I do. I just add more mix to it, fluff it up, and just keep right on going. The beauty of it. Okay, so let's see where we at here. And EFPC. When do we fertilize lemon, orange, and fig, tr fig trees? Um, really, springtime, maybe two or three times a year. I will go ahead in the spring and um, broadcast either Osmocote or 10-10-10, what, whatever I have available and, what, and water that in. You know, you could go with the um, fertilizers that are formulated for citrus, they have a little more um, of the micronutrients in there, and that, that, that would be fine. But I'm, I'm a very simple man when it comes to fertilization, and I will fertilize with whatever I have on hand, and it'll, it'll be fine. Generally, springtime, it's that granular in, into the um, citrus, and then a couple times during the year, I'll do a liquid feed on those. But, but that, that's, that's all I do. Now, I, I, will, I will be honest. I'm always honest in these. Do my, tr are my trees the most beautiful out there? No. But they, they, produ they produce citrus for me, and that's all I'm interested in. I'm not looking for pretty trees. I want pretty fruit. Yeah, like this. This is the goal right there. So that, I, I hope that answers your questions. Okay, so Gail asks, what fertilizers do I use in the earth box? Good question. If you look at the directions for, for Earthbox and what they say, and, and they try and make it simple, you can they, they recommend using anywhere from a 555 to a 151515, two cups per earth box. Now, to me, that's that's excessive. You you'll really get into that um, situation where you have more vegetative growth. If you're using 15, 15, 15, I like to, I like to grow my plants on the lean side. And so I'll use one cup, it's not two cups, one cup of five, five, five. Now, if I, if I have 15, 15, 15, that's three times as much. So I back down how much I put in the earth box. And what I do then is through the growing season, I add calcium nitrate right into the reservoir tube. And that supplies readily available nitrogen, readily available calcium to that, to those plants when they, when they need it. Um, again, I'm not looking for big, beautiful plants. I'm looking for productive plants. And that's always been um, the, the case with me and how I've gotten the, the, best, the best growth. In fact, using the, ca the calcium nitrate Earthbox has incorporated that into their recommendations. We started talking about that on the Earthbox forum, oh, probably like 2010, and where, where I was using the calcium nitrate because I, I made the analogy that sometimes our plants in our vegetable garden are a little hungry and they need a snack, just like us. Sometimes we get hungry and we need a snack. And so when I saw that the plants looked like they needed some more nutrition, I started adding calcium nitrate. And way back in 2010, that calcium nitrate um, application has become known as the snack. I think, I think that was just a, a, fun, a fun way to look at it. 
And that's something that I'd like say Earthbox has incorporated into the recommendations now. So that that's what that's what I would do with the with the um, with the fertilizers. Now, Gail, if you want to use the you know the the organic fertilizers, go for it. You still need to figure out if you want to stay organic. You still need to figure out how you can supplement some some of those some of those fertilizers. So just keep keep that in mind. Okay, so Robin, we're back to more. Boy, we're really talking about earth boxes today. This is one of my favorite ask me anything's. I have to dump one because the tube has gotten sideways and the, the auto water continues dripping. Yeah, so sometimes you, you could do that. Now, I, I'll tell you what. If you were to take that reservoir tube and kind of pull it out and take your garden hose with a spray nozzle on it and start spraying into that tube and pushing that tube back into place, what, whatever you've got, in there, you'll tend to push out the uh, the debris that's causing it to constantly drip, and that's what it is. There's debris that has built up in there, and instead of wicking up into the mix, it's wicking out the drain hole. So get, give that a try before you dump it out, please. Yeah, I, you might you might uh, you might you might might like that better. Okay, so Dean. Can, can you share again which soil mix you use? I always use the mix from work until I retired and, and moved from Ohio. <laughs> Not really a fan of the of the of the bag mix from from Earthbox. Yes, yeah, some of some of the work material work does pretty good, right? Um, as as far as growing mix, I use professional growing mixes. Um, in the past, I've used Sunshine Number Eight. Uh, Pro Mix works well. Um, down here in um, the, in um, South Mississippi, um, Jolly Gardener works well. Um, I've I've started using um, some of the Tiger Grow that was developed from our friends over at LSU Ag Center, and which is produced at Phillips Park right here in Mississippi and Brookhaven. Um, but but it, but if you just go with a prof with a professional mix, you know some of those you know Metro mix. Some of those others go to your independent garden centers. They'll, that's that's where you're going to find these good mixes. I wouldn't go with the um, with the uh, Miracle Grow. I've used Miracle Grow before; it's fine. If you want to go that route, go the Moisture Control. That's a mix of Core and Good Peat. Not you know that that's in the blue and black bag. The yellow and green bag of Miracle Grow is like a lumber yard in a bag. It, I don't like it. It will work. You could make it work, but go, go with go with a with a better mix that you can find. I hope that answers your question. If Dean, if you want some more specific recommendations, go ahead, email me, Ellen, queue it up, southerngardening at msstate.edu, and I'll, I'll give you more information on that. And that goes for anybody that wants more information on good growing mixes, whether it's earth box, containers, how or heck, raised beds or in ground. I, I can help you with that. Now, Marilyn's asking how much dolomite in an earth box. Um, the dolomite is, I, I always add um, two cups of dolomite. I use the um, pelletized. You, you could use the pulverized, but it gets dusty. The pelletized works just well. But two cups per earth box. And generally what I'll do when we're planting tomatoes in the springtime two cups of dolomite, um, replant the tomatoes in the fall, one cup per, dolo per dolomite, but I'm always adding dolomite to the mix, it really with whatever we're, we're, uh, we're growing because these professional mixes are going to be light in the calcium and the magnesium content. So it, it's, it's good to do that. You won't get in trouble pH-wise. I, I checked that and dispelled that years ago. Always adding dolomite into those professional growing mixes is a good is a good thing. Okay, so oh, that's a comment I made. Yeah, Robin, how often and how much snack do you use in the tube? That really depends on that. And the snack is the calcium nitrate that we were talking about. That really depends on the um, crop. If it's tomatoes and peppers, that calcium nitrate is anywhere from every 10 to 14 days, once, once, once the plants get up about this big. You don't have to start right away. 
But once the plants get up, start doing that every 10, 14 days. Uh, and in fact, if you think that that's a lot, it's actually less than MSU Extension recommends for in-ground gardening when they're saying a tablespoon per month per plant. And if we look at in, in what we're doing with the, um, with the calcium nitrate with the earth boxes is a teaspoon every 10 to 14 days. And that's for two plants. We're only using about half rate of the calcium nitrate versus what's being recommended in ground gardening. So that, that's, that's what I do. And you don't have to dissolve it. Just dump, dump the granules down the uh, reservoir tube. It'll solubilize. Your, your, plant, your, your plants will love that. You know, we're, we're getting, where are we at here? Gosh, Ellen, we're at 40 minutes already. Can you believe that? This has been fun this morning. And what I'm going to do is, first, I'm going to say how disappointed I am that only one person, Judy Wood, has stumped me today. Um, but what, what I want to do is just leave you with this. You know, we're 75 degrees here in, in Ocean Springs on December 10th. This is one of these unicorn years. We have got, I didn't pull all my peppers out earlier, kind, kind of thinking that maybe, just maybe we'll have, we'll have a nice, you know, a warm winter. And so I, I was out this morning and we still have some of the red bikino peppers growing. You see, those, those, are, those are all starting to grow. These are plants that I cut back because they were getting too big and I couldn't harvest all the peppers. Well, they're December 10th. They're still producing. We're, we've got the yellow piquinos are still producing. We've got the little balls of molten sun. These are the ahi cherapitas. These, these, these little, these little um, cute little yellow peppers that will just light you up. They're, they're growing. Um, you know, tomatoes, orange blossom, not, not as big as what you get during the warm part of the year, but hey, that, that's a nice looking tomato. We've got Garden Gem, Mississippi Medallion winner from Proven Winners. Uh, what else we have? We've got Indigo Kumquat. These are these little kind of purple, yet yellow tomatoes that, that, that I've been showing off. And then we also have, this is a paste tomato that I call Heinz. Don't ask me where I got the seed. It's a secret. But, but I, call, I call this Heinz paste tomato. That, that's, that's, been, that's, been good, that's been going real, really good, really good for us. And so with that, if um, nobody has any um, stumper questions for me, I'm going to go ahead and say adios for the year. Thanks for joining us, you know, through these um, Ask, ask me anything for Southern Gardening. These are always fun to do on a monthly basis. Um, remember, we do do the um, daily dose of hort. I know this year we haven't done as many as we did when I was stuck at home last year, but I've got a bunch of them that are coming up here in um, December. And then we'll start up again, you know, after the first of the year. So this one. Okay, wait a second here before I get... Okay, so Gail, I, I don't I don't understand your your I don't understand your question here. Go ahead and restate that. Um, but I just want to say, listen, thanks for joining us through all this, being members of Southern Gardening Nation. Let's see here. What do we got? Always in Sue, thanks, Dean, thanks, Becky, thanks. You know, everybody have a very Merry Christmas, happy holidays. Let's get over onto the other side and you know, let's, let's just keep gardening and appreciate it. And thanks again. And we will see you next time for another, not daily dose, but ask me anything for Southern Gardening. Take care. We'll see you.